Star Wars, Heart of the Jedi, by Kenneth C. Flint. Chapter 11 Luke's bantha suddenly lurched sharply sideways. It slammed its shoulder hard into the side of the other beast's head, in what seemed a deliberate blocking move. Dovra Akru's bantha was jolted off stride by the blow. The champion was jerked back, his blade dropping. The weaponless young Jedi took swift advantage of the opening. In a desperate countermove, he drew his legs up, crouched, and sprang across onto the other beast. The huge warrior once more lifted the gaffy stick to strike, but his reaction was too slow. Luke dove in, seizing the stick as well, and the two grappled, yanking and twisting savagely at the weapon as each sought to win control of it. They swayed precariously on top of the still loping beast. Luke scrambled for a hold on its back with only his legs as he battled with both hands. The champion fought back from a secure position, his legs locked tight around its neck. His strength was more than a match for Luke's, and his position gave him an advantage. He used it, cunningly. After a brief tussle, he twisted abruptly away from Luke, heaved hard, and hauled the Jedi bodily over his head. With nothing to hold on to, the young man found himself flying over the warrior's shoulders as he rolled him forward, and plunging down the front of the bantha's face. His grip on the stick broke. He toppled over the muzzle, gasping out at anything to stop himself. He ceased flailing, but only to find himself suspended from the beast's wide nose, hanging on to its formidable lower tusks. This unlikely position he held only a moment. The bantha snorted loudly and opened its mouth to give a deep, resounding bleat of anger. Luke stared down at the wet cavern of its huge throat as its rank breath blasted into his face. Then his hand slipped from the tusks and he fell, dropping between the hairy pillars of the pumping front legs and vanishing from sight beneath the animal. The bantha continued on its lumbering run. Dovra Akru turned to look back, clearly expecting to see Luke's trampled form churned through and kicked out behind. But the Jedi was not yet finished. He hung now from the belly of the beast by a stubborn grip on its shaggy fur, his legs and rear end dragging on the ground. He glanced back along the bantha's underside to where the giant hind legs stomped ahead like a pair of pile drivers on either side of the dragging mass of tail. Only death by crushing awaited him there. The only way was back up, so, gritting his teeth against the pain of grasping the harsh fur, Luke began to haul himself up and around the curve of the great chest, crawling out behind the right front leg and climbing the beast's side. Dovra Akru still sat staring rearward, his strained posture indicative of mounting puzzlement. He turned back towards the front and leaned far forward, peering down past the mount's head, seeking some sign of his vanished opponent. He thus didn't see the left hand of Luke shoot up to grab hold of the hair of the beast's back close behind him. It was only when the young man's head lifted into view that the movement caught the corner of the champion's eye. His own head whipped around and he stared in surprise, but only for an instant. <laughs> then his right arm was sweeping the weapon around and down in a hard chop at Luke but his swing was wide to avoid hitting the beast too. Luke flattened against its side and the blade whistled past his skull. Then, in a final, full effort of will and strength, he shot his right arm towards the warrior. His hand went for Dovra Akru's middle, grabbing hold of the leggings' wrist waist strap. He yanked towards him as he fell backwards from the animal, his weight drawing the other with him. Already overbalanced by his wasted swing, the champion had no chance to recover. The two plummeted from the bantha together, Luke struck the ground on his shoulders and back, somersaulting on over to land on his hands and knees. He was on his feet instantly, crouched to meet his opponent's next attack. But Dovra Akru had sailed beyond him, crashing down on his face with a full mass of weight. He lay crumpled and motionless a few feet from Luke. The Jedi stepped to the fallen warrior, moving warily, ready for an attack. For a trick. With a foot, he prodded the being's side, getting no result. Luke knelt and rolled him over. Dovra Akru fell back limp limply. He was breathing, but seemed to be stunned. The bantha stick dropped from his opened hand. Luke picked the weapon up and rose to his feet. As he did, the champion gave a sharp groan and pushed himself up on his elbows. But he stopped moving abruptly as his gaze fell upon the glinting metal point held over his chest. He lay motionless, clearly waiting for the end. But Luke stood motionless as well, only looking down at the warrior. You do not kill him, called a voice. 
He looked around to see the Otal and Jatal Or striding up to him, a crowd of the sand people close behind. The mounted warriors who had formed the ring were riding in too, pulling up in a tighter circle around him. You really expect me to kill your champion? Luke asked the chieftain as through Jotal. The Otal shrugged. It is part of the contest, he responded through his translator. To the death, I said. He understands that. Well, I don't, Luke replied sharply. It's over. I'm not killing someone just to prove something to you. The chief denied him thoughtfully. So, you will not kill, even if it means you would save your own life. Luke looked from him around the circle of armed warriors, staring grim-faced down at their mounts, then back to the Otal. No, not even for that, he said firmly. If I truly am a Jedi Knight, I won't dishonor the name. He cast the weapon down at the Otal's feet. Dovra Akru sat up, obviously both surprised and bewildered by his clemency. His chieftain bent and took the gaffy stick. He looked from its keen blades to the young man and spoke in solemn tones. He says you are indeed not like the others of your kind, Jatal Or pronounced with great conviction. None has ever acted towards us with such good intention or honesty, nor have we ever seen one of your race or even of our own fight with such amazing skill. He believes, as I do, that it truly is some powerful fate which guides your actions here, and we must give it no more argument. He bowed to Luke. He accepts the life of his warrior from you, Luke Skywalker, and gives you your own in return. The worn and battered young man took a deep breath and smiled in relief. Thank you, he said most sincerely. Leia and Gowen sat at the small table in the main cabin of the Millennium Falcon. Their heads were close together as they went over the information scrolling by on the data pad on the data pad screen open before them, discussing in muted tones the finer points of Imperial Protocols on display. Across the cabin, Han Solo checked the instrument readings on a bank of system screens and cast sidelong disgruntled glances towards the pair. He spoke in muted tones also, but only to himself. A loud gronk from the, opening board, from the open boarding ramp brought the attention of all three around it. Chewbacca was just coming up, cup, coming up it, ducking under the low hatch to step into the cabin. Behind him, C-3PO was clanking up into the ship. Well, look who finally got here, said Han Solo, his sarcasm not quite hit hiding his relief. I was actually starting to worry about you guys. Not that I'd worry or anything. Do you know what time it is? A scowling Leia asked the pair. We're supposed to be leaving within the hour. Chewbacca gave an abashed sounding whimper at the rebuke, but the droid's response was prim. We are well aware of that, Princess Leia. You will most assuredly not be delayed in your departure. I suppose not, she had to admit, the sternness fading from her tone. Still, we were concerned. Look, let's cut the chatter. Han, Han put in, getting to his feet. We've got too much to do. Repio, run a last diagnostic on the Falcon's Navicomp systems. Got to be ready to feed our destination coordinates once we're away. And I have work for you as well, Leia told the droid. You're going to be going along with us as our chief assistant. I see. Drupio replied flatly, clearly unaffected by the news. I thought you'd be pleased, she said. Yeah, Goldenrod, put in Han. You were complaining about being left out. There's a chance for some excitement. You ought to thank her highness. I see no reason to do so, Drupio replied reasoningly. I had assumed I would be chosen to go. What other protocol droid has my experience? Now hold on, Han began, sounding a bit miffed at the droid's somewhat lacking graciousness. No, said Leia defensively. He's right. He's worked hard for this. He deserves it. Han's irritation subsided. Yeah, I guess. Well then, 3PO said briskly, starting way towards the service corridor. If that's all decided, I'll go see to Captain Solo's diagnostic. It is, as usual, my job to ensure that things run smoothly. We're real honored you can help, said Han dryly. Chewie, Chewie and I need to run a last check. Look to the Wookiee. 
You did get that spare rotor, didn't you? Chewie lifted a small box and barked affirmative. Good, said Han. Then reminded of something else, he turned and called after the droid. Hey, wait, 3PO, what about my ale? The golden being paused at the corridor opening and looked back at him. I was unable to find any, 3PO replied. And speaking frankly, Master Solo, your physique might well befit you might well befit by your being without it. With that parting comment, he went off into the corridor. Han stared at the droid for a nonplussed moment, then looked indignantly. My physique? He looked down at himself and pinched the flesh of his belly in assessment. He looked around to Leia. Was that hunk of metal making crack about my weight? He asked her. Leia looked to Han over with amused but critical eye. I'd say he was right again, was her own judgment. A big hand smoothed the thick white ointment on an inflamed welt across Luke Skywalker's shoulder with surprising gentleness. The shirtless young Jedi sat patiently on a stool in the throne room of the Otal, while Jatal Orr tended to his wounds. He had many of these. The fight with the Dune Maggots and his contest with Dovra Akru had left little of his torso unmarked by vivid welts, bruises, and cuts. The Otal, at the moment, the room's only other occupant, looked on from his rattan throne at his translator, as his translator carefully smeared more ointment from an earthenware pot over the last welts. He was clearly admiring of the young man's stoicism. He says, it is much that you have endured in this one day, Jatal Or passed on to Luke. The desert, the torture, the fight. Are you certain you want no time for rest? No, I'm fine, really, Luke said. Just a little sore. The salve will help with that, the man assured. Many generations have found their healing in it. It is squeezed from the tendrils of a rare desert plant. Most miraculous. The warrior finished his effort, setting the jar down beside him. Work some also into your hands, young champion, he told Luke. It will suit them as well. Thanks, Luke told him. He looked at his palms. They were bright red. Their outer layer of skin all but flayed away by the sanding action of the bantha's hair. He scooped a blob of cream out of the jar and rubbed his sensitized palms gingerly together, massaging it in. The soothing effects showed clearly in his face. Miraculous for sure, he said. Even Yoda's use of the Force couldn't heal like this. Wait a moment, wait a moment. Did we just get Force healing? Did all the complaints about Force healing from the sequel trilogy just get undone? By a non-canon, never published expanded universe novel wow color me surprised i have no knowledge of this one you speak of said jatal or but for one of your powers to speak so but for one of your powers to speak so is a compliment to us luke finished working the cream in he took up the tunic that lay across his lap and slipped it back on raised rising from the stool. Well, thank you, he told the chieftain and warrior graciously. But now I should be going. Jital Or translated for his chief, and the Otal replied. He says, very well. The other passed back with the included tone of regret. But if you mean to depart from us so soon, he has some things for you. He lifted his voice to call out. Dovra Akru! Out through the curtained opening stepped the huge warrior. He carried the Jedi's utility belt with his equipment pouches and all weapons on it. We are most happy to return your weapons to you, Jital said. Especially this one. He pointed to Dovra Akru's head. The big warrior turned it to show a large bandage across one ear. The Otal says it was his own fault, Jital Orr translated for the chief. He was examining it and accidentally turned it on. The translator took his belt and handed it to Luke. It took only a part of his ear, he added for himself. A good lesson about the danger of curiosity. Your floating platform is on the surface, ready for you. The Otal passed to Luke as the Jedi buckled the belt on. But there is something else. The chieftain rose and walked to the long table of scavenged objects. 
He picked up the milk-white milk globe and turned to Luke, speaking most gravely. You came to find this, explained Jatal Orr. We sensed it had special value to our friend, the old wizard, who was also a friend to you. You risked your life for it, so we now make it a gift, make you a gift of it, as you too have become our friend. The chieftain held it out. Luke stepped forward and carefully took it from him. The young Jedi held the smooth bowl in his hands, looking in wonder at it. It was all but glowing in the subdued light of the room. I thank you especially for this, he told the chieftain through Jatal Orr. He says that clearly there is a great meaning in this thing for you, the translator returned to him. Might he know what it is? I, uh, don't really know myself, Luke told him truthfully. It might be the secret to my whole life. Then we will pray that it reveals itself to you, the Otal answered. He gestured to his champion. Dovra Akru stepped up and handed Luke a large cloth carrying bag. The Jedi slipped the bowl inside and slung the bag across his shoulder. Now we are ready to go, Jatal Orr announced. The others wait above to say farewell. They escorted Luke up out of the central meeting pit. On the surface, beside all the other warriors of the clan had gathered about his hovering sand skimmer. As Luke and his escort approached it, one warrior stepped from the group and handed Jatal Orr Luke's long outer robe. I say goodbye to you, for all of my people, the translator told Luke as he passed him the garment. For myself, I wish to say that I am not sorry you survived. I feel it was for the right. Um, I'm glad you think so, Luke replied. But he might have won. It was as much luck as anything that kept me alive. That, and... That bantha. That beast was indeed a most clever one, Jatal Orr agreed. Too bad it has vanished. Vanished? Luke echoed. How? When the riders came in from their ring, it had already run away, the warrior supplied. No matter, stray beasts usually wander back soon enough. I hope that one does, said Luke. I owe it. He slipped into the robe and stepped up to his skimmer. As he began to mount, the Otal's hand fell on his arm, stopping him. He turned to look at the chief. He would wish that you might stay, Jatal Orr translated with feeling. He believes now that there might be value in more talk between our people and those as honorable as you. There could be very much that we learn of each other's lives. I hope that someday I can come back, Luke sincerely returned. I truly do, but for now, I have a long way to go. The Ortal listened to his warrior's translation of this. He nodded and replied. He says, I understand. Jatal Orr explained, You have a warrior's quest. It cannot be denied. The chieftain stepped back and let him climb onto the platform, but said something more as he did so. The Ortal says not to be in too great a hurry, young warrior said Jatal Orr. Already your boldness has put you in much peril. You act as if some relentless enemy pursued you. Luke gave a little smile. Only myself. Our most dangerous foe, the warrior said gravely. He lifted a hand in farewell. May the breath be always at your back. Luke waved an answer, twisting the skimmer's hand controls, and sent the little machine gliding away. The others waved too as they watched him go. Several warriors ran up the big nearby dune to see him sweep away and shrink down to a distant speck. When he vanished from sight, they began to walk down from the mound. One warrior stumbled and looked around indignantly to see what had tripped him up. His eyes widened and he gave a cry of alarm. Other warriors rushed to him and stood staring wide-eyed too. A hand, its fingers splayed and stiff, protruded from the ground. One warrior knelt and began to brush the sand away. An arm, and then the top of a buried form came into view. As the warrior scooped more sand from about it, what was piled up on top suddenly avalanched down, revealing the masked face of a Tuscan clansman. It had a jagged tear in one cheek. A goggled eyepiece was askew, and two of its head spikes were gone.